Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of heaven's harmony. song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Good morning and welcome. Let's try that again. Good morning. Very good. Thank you. I want to welcome to you to our worship service this morning. In a short bit, here we'll have Daniel and Martha Gately. They were with the Mission Coalition in Columbia. And sit back and relax and enjoy the video that we're going to see. Thank you. Hello, Ebenezer Mennonite. Um, I'm Daniel. This is my wife, Martha, we're the Gateleys, and uh, we have two small children. We have Saoirse, uh, she was born about three months ago, uh, and we have uh, Russell Akira, who's taking a nap right now. Uh, he's almost three years old. We are here in Bogota, Colombia. Um, <clears throat> we're making this video from our apartment, which is close to the deaf school where we have our office and this is where we're working. We're working with the translation team, the Colombian Sign Language Translation team here. We're with we're members of SIL, the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Um, they have a, a long history of translating the Bible into spoken languages. Um, they are involved now in translating the Bible into sign languages and that's a much more recent endeavor. So we do a bunch of different things. I am um, currently the translation consultant in training here for the um, sign language translation team. That means that I do the checking against, I check the drafts against the Hebrew and Greek for the team and help them to make corrections and just make a much better product at the end. I am training to take over that work full time for, their te for the team here. We are currently working on 1 Corinthians, as well as a faith and prayer DVD. Um, faith and prayer are topic, topical translations where they take verses from all over the Bible and make like a Bible study DVD out of them. Um, and Daniel is working on designing a curriculum for the new missionaries who are joining our team um, to train them as they, as they reach the mission field. Uh, we have a few different prayer needs. Um, you can be praying for Saoirse. Um, she's had a couple of different um, pretty serious health scares since she was born three months ago, so we've spent a lot of time in the hospital recently. Um, she was on oxygen until um, just about a week ago. She's doing better now, but we would appreciate uh, prayers for her. Um, you can be praying for 
my language learning. I am uh, still studying Spanish. Um, I've come a long way in the last year and a half, but I still have a long way to go. Pray for the deaf community here. When COVID hit, uh, the deaf community um, was, was really fragmented and scattered, and it's still in the process of pulling itself back together and reestablishing a lot of that, um, uh, that Christian fellowship that was lost during the pandemic. And pray for the orientation program um, that I'm involved in. Hopefully we'll, we'll bring in uh, more people into sign language work and make that transition into the field much, much smoother for them. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for your support and your prayers. We appreciate you all. We really, really appreciate you. Um, thank you very much. Welcome everyone this morning to Ebenezer. My name is Nick, one of the pastors here. If you have a bulletin, you can grab it. I would thank everybody who's viewing online this morning. I'm glad you're here. Send us a note so we know that you are watching and listening as we go. Uh, first and foremost, keep up with your Bible reading and your reading programs. Uh, it's healthy. It's good for you. Uh, it's good for the church. A couple quick notes inside your bulletin under the opportunities uh, today at 4 p.m., conference room, down on that end of the building, conference room at 4 p.m., there's going to be a prayer time for the crew that went to Guatemala, that's in Guatemala. Uh, please feel free, come over and join uh, for that prayer time. If you're not able, please just take a moment, stop and pray and lift them up so they have an effective and safe time. Also, just as a note, Right below that, next Sunday, there's going to be uh, an old church potluck. It'll be a classic potluck, so bring two dishes. Uh, meat won't be uh, brought, so feel free to bring uh, those. And if you're not able to bring, please come anyway. We would love to have you here and just spend some time eating together and getting to know one another better. Thank you. With that, Job. Morning, Ebenezer Church. Uh, if you'll join with me in prayer this morning. Father God, we just um, come before you today, Lord, we just uh, thank you um, just for who you are, God, that you serve a God that hears us when we pray, uh, you are a God uh, that answers our prayers, and we just uh, praise you and glorify your name today. God, as we come to you today, Lord, we just pray that you would quicken our hearts, um, just make light of anything in, in our life that's not pleasing to you. God, we forgive, we ask you to forgive us for falling short. We've all fallen short of your glory. Um, today, we just want to think of those who are not able to join us here in person today. Those who are uh, battling surgeries, we think of uh, Rosie and, and John Good as she's transitioning back here. Lord, I pray that her physical therapy would go well, um, that the pain uh, would be limited, God, and that your hand of healing would be upon her. We Think of anybody else uh, in our midst that can't be here that's dealing with physical, emotional, spiritual issues, those who are battling uh, cancer uh, treatments, God, that you would just sustain them. Father God, we lift up the 35 individuals from Ebenezer that are in Guatemala this week. First of all, we thank you for your hand of safety, for getting them there um, safely, God. Uh, we pray that as they're, uh, they're serving in Guatemala, that they would shine Jesus' light there. We know there's a language barrier, but you're, you work way beyond language barriers. We just pray that our group there would remain safe, but they would also remain strong in their faith there, and that the message of Jesus Christ would go out. Uh, we lift up our missionaries of the week, Daniel and Martha Gately, and the work that they're doing in Columbia. Lord, we lift up their, their small child, their daughter, and the health issues that she's had, God. And we just ask that you would touch her and heal their young baby. We pray for the translations that they're doing there, that your word would go out uh, to the deaf community. And also, uh, just Lord, help them to translate the gospel clear, precise, and in a way that the people there are able to understand it, God. Uh, we lift up uh, Richard Greenway to you uh, as he passed away. And we just ask that um, the family be comforted with the funeral um, yesterday. She would be with the family. We don't mourn as the world mourns. We have a hope in you, Jesus, and we thank you for that. I lift up um, our staff here at Ebenezer, our committees. 
God, the work that they're doing. We're so thankful for their, their leadership here at Ebenezer and everything that they're doing. We know that Satan does not like what's happening here at Ebenezer. And, uh, Lord, we just pray protection upon uh, them and their family. Lord, we pray that today as uh, Ron Epp and the, and the crew lead us in worship, that our hearts would just be quieted. We live in a busy world where our minds are going a hundred different directions, God. Help us to just focus on you today, worship you today in spirit and truth. Uh, we pray as Nick delivers the word today, continues in Proverbs chapter 3, um, that your word would just quicken our hearts, um, that we would take this word today, apply it. Uh, Lord, challenge us today with your word. Speak through Nick. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, and thank you. Uh, Job, will you please stand with us? We know the sun is shining outside. Uh, I hope that the sun is shining in your heart. If mm -hmm. not, through worship, uh, he can lift our spirits and our heart and join us in singing. wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best lovingly it's part of plain and flesh so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus 
thought, oh, words with heavenly comfort trot, whatever I do, whatever I be, still, it's God's hand that leadeth me. Please be seated at this last song.
Thank you, Ron. God is indeed in the business of leading us. Sometimes he uses various ways. And today, we're going to get an opportunity to have him lead us through his word, through some unusual sources. Um, God, in Proverbs, uses animals to teach us wisdom about life. And we're going to look at some of those today. But before we do, we will be in Proverbs chapter 6. Before we do, let's just pray that God would help us. Father, we look to you in this hour and ask that by your strength and by your spirit, that you would take your word and you would minister it to our hearts, that you would grant us hearts that can be changed, grant us hearts that can be made wise, grant us hearts that will humble ourselves beneath your teaching, beneath your wisdom, beneath your word, for our good and your glory, Lord. Help us to that end, in Jesus' name. Amen. Animals are quirky things, but they tend to act in the same way all the time. Animals act like the type of animal they are. This spring, I had a rather um, irritating situation with animals. Uh, if I haven't stated it before, I'll state it clearly. I'm not a big cat person. Um, I'm just not, okay? We'll leave that alone at that. But, but um, out in the corner of our little property, we have this big old, like, uh, telephone post, and on it is this little bluebird nest. And sure enough, this spring, this beautiful bluebird couple came and took up residence in our little nest, and I was eagerly watching and occasionally peeking in, and sure enough, little bluebird eggs in the nest, and... And then, it, and then a few weeks would go by, and and one of the kids was out in the garden, and they announced, "Looks like the cat got the bluebird." Oh, I was significantly less a cat person at that moment than I was even before. How dare that cat get my bluebird? I was like offended, and. I was uncharacteristically of myself ranting and raving about how I like bluebirds and how cats are the scourge and, and um, maybe not that uncharacteristic. And I was gently reminded that cats act like cats, right? That's what cats do. God has made cats to catch and kill things. Actually, that's why we have cats, outside cats, to make sure that the mice and the rats around the farm don't make it all the way inside the house to do what cats are designed to do, right? We expect them to do their job. Just wish they'd leave my bluebirds alone, right? Animals would do that. I was reminded as I was pre preparing animals uh, act certain ways. I grew up on a pig farm, and part of our farrowing farm required that um, after so many weeks, we would pregnancy test our sows to make sure that they were going to have baby pigs in a little while. And part of that meant that you would drop feed in a big pen of pigs, and then you would take like an ultrasound machine, literally, and you would kneel down, and you would put it on the sow's belly, and, and you would read it and see if they were indeed pregnant with baby pigs. Well, w when pigs eat, they're pigs, right? They, they want all the food. That's just how pigs are put together. And so if there's a pig in their road that has food there, they're going to maybe lean over and, and, and bite them a little bit to say, get out of the way so I can have your food too. On this given day, I'm going around doing my thing and this big old sow backs out and she thinks I'm another pig who's getting food. And so she leans over with her mouth and f finds this little spot on your side, you know, that's, and she gives me this, this little bite and they bite her really hard, right? That's what pigs do. She was just acting like she acts. She mis and mistook me for another pig. <clears throat> we'll leave that all alone. <laughs> Animals act like God made them to act. People are usually outside of that. Wisdom from God comes from these places, even animals. And today we're going to look at five different animals 
Uh, we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and we're going to look at some animals that are going to teach us some wisdom about life. Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 1 says, if my, my son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge to a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth and caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the of the fowler. So just to unpack a little bit, it, what he's saying here is in the day, particularly back in those days, uh, the time of Solomon, what would happen is he, somebody would need somebody to, if you will, sign. They didn't really sign, but they would, they would agree by a shaking of the hand that they would agree to what we would call co-sign a loan or call so, co-sign an agreement for uh, a material possession or money or whatever they would. And, and that's what he's getting to here. It's like if you have, you know, haphazardly you and your buddy and your buddy says, hey, I need this, but I need an extra person to agree with this. Will, will you go in with me and just sign up for me or co-sign on this loan with me? Will you do that for me? And the implication is it's not a family member. It's a, a neighbor or stranger. It's somebody who uh, you're not obligated to do that with. In our world, we don't have the same type of gravity, if you will, about co-signing on a loan. And this is the reason why. Our world has cleaned it up and to a point where, say, you uh, co-sign a loan for somebody and then they default on the loan. And then the, the bank comes to you and says, hey, you need to pay their loan. And you, by obligation, should pay that. However, if you're not able to pay that, our court system actually allows you to do this thing called file for bankruptcy protection. The court will protect you. You cannot pay that loan and, well, there's a consequences, but not like in these days. In these days, if you co-signed a loan and you didn't pay the loan, they could take you to court and they didn't allow you. Bankruptcy protection. And if you couldn't pay the money, they could literally take your person and they could sell you to someone as a slave, which may take a lifetime to get out of. So what he's saying here is, if you have agreed to something that could have a lifelong consequence to you, should this person fail and you can't pay it, you're risking your entirety of your life by doing something. He's saying, if you're doing this, if you said this, you've haphazardly agreed to something, you know, just, hey, we're just, we're just buds here. We're just good buddies. We'll take care of each other. If you've done that, recognizing the risk of this and the idea, and he's using terms here to repeat, if you're snared by the words of your mouth, if you're caught in the words of your mouth, if you've come attached to where now you are you can't get out of this unless you come to a different agreement he says then do this my son save yourself deliver yourself for you have come into the hand of your neighbor that means you are now his possession if you will go hasten plead urgently with your neighbor the implication here is go humiliate yourself if necessary grovel beg do whatever it takes to get out of that. Even to the point it says, give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Don't even sleep on this. Don't run, don't walk to get out of it because your life is at risk. And he says, save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter or like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Anybody who has hunted white-tailed deer will know how careful they are to not be hunted. If they know you're around, if they know you're a risk, they are super vigilant. And as soon as they determine that there's a danger, what happens? 
up comes that tail, and they're out of dodge, right? They're gone. They're running away. Or same with a bird. If you catch a bird, and they, they can't wait to get away. I was reminded years, I mean, this was like 50 years ago. Back in the day, um, the farm, we used to raise turkeys out in the field. You, know, you just All you had to do is stretch an electric fence about that high off the ground, and they wouldn't get out, right? They're not a very bright bird. And so we'd raise thousands of turkeys out in this wooded area. And unfortunately at that time there was, there was a lot of these great horned owls. And great horned owls are like super predators if you're not aware of that. So um, if a great horned owl would happen to find your turkey spot, um, they would come down. They would find a roosting spot. And when it got dark, the great horned owls would go and they would they would start killing numerous turkeys. They wouldn't eat them. They just killed them. And so back in those days, like 50 years ago, uh, the, the, the DNR said, hey, if they're getting your turkeys, you can, you can capture them. And so the way to capture them is you take a post and you stick it right in your turkey yard about 10 feet off the ground. You put like a number one foot trap on top because... The owl's going to come down, he's going to sit on the post, and he's going to decide which of turkey he's going to start eating at, or killing at once, right? And so, next morning you go down and check the turkeys, and they're hanging from the trap is this great horned owl. And so, on this given day, um, there was a guy whose name will not be mentioned, whose job was to go and dispatch the great horned owl in, that's there, so... He gets there, and he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? And so he gets there, and he brings out his shotgun because he doesn't know what else to do with it. And so he brings the pole down, and as he's attempting to get a bead on this owl, he, he finally touches off a shot. But right before it, the owl flops this way, and like three turkeys go down right behind it. It's like just drop, drop, drop. Yeah, like I said, he wasn't the sharpest knife, right? So then he's like, this isn't working at all. I better do something different. So, so he decides to put the gun away because that went really badly. And so he, he goes back to the truck and, and there's an old grain shovel in there. He says, maybe I could get, get him with a grain shovel. So he goes out there, and of course, the owl's all bristles and flopping, carrying it. And so he proceeds to, to give one big whack to this owl, which he misses, hits the trap. Trap springs open. And what do you think that big old owl did in like a fraction of a second? Instantly, whoop, and off he went. And there he was standing with three dead turkeys, an empty trap, and no owl. The writer of the Proverbs is saying, don't risk your entire life. Get away as fast as that old owl could get away. Don't take the chance. Don't put your future at risk. And in this case, it was like signing on the line for somebody. But there's other ways that you can make agreements or come into con connection with other people that will risk your future. Corinthians 15 says this, Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. If you strike hands with the wrong people, if you come into relationships with the wrong people, you're risking your future. You're risking by your decision making, by coming into agreement with the wrong people, perhaps your life. Happened all the time in Milwaukee. You start hanging with the wrong people. They will lead you to a road of destruction. They will lead you into a life of selfish, hedonistic, well, and eventually criminal activity. And criminal activity, at least where I was working at, led to death. Bad company ruins good morals. But there's other ways that I also figured that we can learn from this. Things we need to get away with. 
get away from. I mean, really get away from it. And I started thinking through this. What's keeping you from, or who is keeping you from, or what have you done in your life? What have you made agreements to, or what, what have you been, that's keeping you, as I always say, what's keeping you from your Bible reading time? Have you agreed to do stuff in your life that's consuming so much of you and so much of your life that you are neglecting the best things, neglecting your future, neglecting the things of the Lord that you need to get away from? And I don't mean tomorrow, today. You need to get away. You need to make a decision that this is going to trap me and keep me from what God would want me to do. What would God ask you to do in service-wise? That you've already, you've already bound hands to some sort of agreement or some sort of choice of life that would keep you from serving the Lord as he's asking you. Can you get away like a bird that's caught in a trap that when it finally gets released, gets away? Or can you get away like a deer that's being hunted and notice that there's danger of all and run from that? That's what he's saying to his son. Be wise enough to know what to stay away from. And then when you do, get far, far away from that. What seems safe at the moment may cost you dearly in the end. The next animal we're going to get to is the ant. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hand to rest, and poverty will come on you like a robber and want like an armed man. So, what he's getting here is he's saying, first, let me give you the example. Instead of saying at the end of the proverb, he's saying right up front, hey, pay close attention to this little insect. And he's identifying him as a sluggard, you sluggard. Now, now he's not saying that his son is a sluggard based on the first verse. But he's identifying anybody here who, who's within the earshot of his teaching who would tend to have the characteristics of, a sluggard, and that's almost a metaphor of animal anyway, right? The slugs, right? Slugs are like really slow. But he says, go to the ant, consider her ways, and be wise. So it's a look at the ant. Now, I think it's interesting. You've got to keep in mind that ants are small, right? And then I started to think about ants are really small. But how small are their brains? I mean, if they, they have got to be... now. Occasionally here at church, we get teeny, teeny, tiny ants, right? I have to wear my glasses to see them. So if I'm going to drink my tea in my cup in the morning, I put my glasses on to make sure before. How tiny must their brains be and their teeny little bodies? How big is your brain? If God has gifted you with a larger brain than an ant... Maybe he's here to help us, right? So he's saying, you with the big brain, look at the, 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 the little insect with the little brain and learn something. Ants are wise in some things. Consider her ways and be wise. It, now it goes in verse 7 saying, without having any chief officer or ruler. Implication here is, the ant doesn't need a boss. To be kicking you in the rear end. Or threatening you. Or, or reminding you. Or driving you to do the job. The ant doesn't need a boss. The ant doesn't need authority, if you will, to say, go do this. She just simply prepares her bread in summer. Gathers her food in harvest. She goes to work when it's time to go to work. You gather summertime. So you, you, you prepare in the summer and in the harvest you get what you need and you're good to go. And then he asks the question, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? 
How long are you just going to rest? How long, when will you arise from your sleep? Which is interesting because the ant doesn't need anybody to get him a wake-up call. The ant doesn't need that. The ant gets up and goes to do it. But here now the sluggard is getting the call. Hey, when are you going to get up? When are you going to, when are you going to get up from your sleep? And then it brings the idea down to a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Each of those indicate an incremental passing of time, of comfort. It's, it's, it's not uncomfortable to find a nice easy chair somewhere and, and a, you know, or maybe a hammock under a shady tree and lay back and enjoy, right? That's okay. Resting isn't always bad. But in this case, it just happens in little increments. A little rest, a little sleeping, a little folding of the hands. And then it says the consequence will come. Consequence, poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. The implications here is summer has come and harvest is now past. You've missed the opportunity. What follows summer and harvest? We all know around here, right? All the farmers, the wheat had to come in, right? Or most of it came in. Why? Well, and it's time to do wheat. You look for a dry day so you can get it out of the field, right? That's how it works. What it's saying here is summer, harvest, winter. And preparation in life has thresholds where you can miss it. I spent a lot of years in Alaska, a lot of years in Alaska. And right now, I can tell you what Alaskans that are worth their salt are doing. They are collecting meat for the freezer and firewood for when winter comes. Because when winter comes, the salmon don't run anymore. And the animals aren't available. When it gets deep cold, you don't want to be out looking for firewood so you can, because if you can get it, if it would it be dry enough to even burn? So now is preparation time. You gather what you need on time. But that work stuff is hard in my experience. Work is often arduous, long, unpleasant. And I started thinking through that. Work in life is hard but poverty's harder. It really is. Working's hard, but coming to having nothing when you need something is soul crushing. Now, don't don't misunderstand me. Not all poverty is caused by laziness. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that whatsoever. Some poverty is caused by other circumstances. Some poverty is caused by health issues. Some poverty is caused by injustice in this world. That's the truth of it. But this poverty is caused by laziness. This poverty is caused by a lack of willingness to do the hard work and to embrace the pain on the other end. Hard work is going to be with us. If you go, if you wanted to, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Adam and Eve eat the tree, the fruit of the tree, and they each get their penalty. In Genesis 3, God says to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Oh, work is hard. Let's just own that. Getting up, doing what you got to do is hard. Being poverty-stricken is harder. Now, I thought it was quite interesting because I also want you to understand, um, if you haven't read, I recommend a book by Ruby Payne called uh, Bridges Out of Poverty. It talks about a lot of the different types of poverty. 
So I don't want you to also think here that I'm just talking about how uh, a little bit of laziness can cause you to come into financial hardship. It can, and it does at times. But there's some other types of sluggardness, laziness, that can affect other parts of your life that you don't want to see go because there's, there's thresholds. We talked a little bit about in Sunday school. You can be, um, well, let me just read this passage. Luke chapter 12 says, uh, Jesus talking to them, saying, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Rich toward God? You mean you can become impoverished toward God in your spiritual life? How does one become impoverished spiritually? Well, pretty much the same way you become impoverished financially, at least according to the proverb and the ant. Consider the ant. Spiritual sluggard. hate to say it that way, but consider that for a second. How are you going to accumulate spiritual wealth, if you will? You're going to just sit back, relax, and wait for God to just pour it on you, right? You're just going to wait for God to make you a spiritual giant. You're just going to wait for God to deliver all the spiritual things that you've been praying for all along. Is that it? Is that how you... Build spiritual wealth? Oh, no. No, no, no. Scripture is pretty clear. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the way, sit in the way, so on and so forth. But every day, day and night, meditates on the word of God. He will be like a tree planted by water. You want to grow spiritually? Well, you got to go to work on some of that stuff. You got to get to know the God of the universe. You got to get in the Word of God. You got to grow together. You got to start serving as God has gifted you. God has gifted enormously. Everybody here who is in Christ has been gifted spiritually to do something. Something. And the question is are you doing it? Or are you sitting back just waiting for life to take place? Sometimes we can simply be lazy toward our Bibles, toward our prayers, toward our service, toward our generosity. Timothy, it says, as for the rich of this present age, and brothers and sisters, we are rich folks, right? If you got up this morning and you could choose from two or three different things for breakfast, you're doing pretty well. To the rich of this present age, charge them not to be arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is truly life. Oh, we can learn from the ant. We can learn to get with it. Stuff is going to be hard, and studying our Bibles and doing that work is hard, but spiritual poverty is harder. It has long-term effects. 
Moving on to the next one. We're going to go to the next animal. Now, if you're in your Bible and want to turn there, go to chapter 14. Chapter 14, there's one of my favorite ones. It's going to talk about oxen. We don't use oxen around here that I'm aware of. We use tractors and, uh, and so on. But in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4, makes a very simple statement. How we can learn from an animals or principles from. 14.4 says, Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But abundant crops comes by the strength of the ox. Interesting. Ox, an oxen or a team of oxen working together could till a bunch of ground. They could tr thresh out the grain. They could do a lot of the work around the farm that it would take a human being a ton of time up and down the field with hand-used tools. But oxen do what all other animals do, right? When you stick them in the stall, they make a mess, right? Right? Livestock are a pain because they're messy and stinky and all that goes with that. So if you elect it, you really like to have a clean stall and, and, and make it nice and neat. Without the oxen, you can. But you're not going to get the harvest of somebody who's got the oxen going. Implication here is, man, without manure, there's not going to be money. That's just how it works. I remember working on the pig farm and we would use uh, all this equipment to, um, to take all the waste out into the fields. And it was really, really unpleasant for our neighbors. Because we'd cover a field with solid liquid manure all day long, right? And everybody who was downwind of that was cursing us. And I remember dad's out there and we're kind of chuckling about it because this stinks to high heaven and <laughs> smells like money. <laughs> Indeed it did. That's how it works. A lot of pigs makes a lot of money. The implication here is productive work is often hard and messy. It's the nature of it. What the, I, what the Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs is saying is don't shy away from that. Don't shy away from the mess of life, of the mess of work and the mess of those things. Don't shy away from that. It'll produce down the road. Hard and messy. One of the jokes uh, we had years gone was you'd see somebody um, and we'd say uh, big hat, no cattle, you know. Nice, fancy outfit looking like, and the idea is that, that guy doesn't have any cows at home because he smells too good, right? He, he's got it nice and looking clean, but his stall is empty. As one of the commentators stated this, foster a farmer's outlook rather than a curator. A curator is somebody who, who keeps a museum neat and tidy. You can just look at stuff, but it doesn't produce anything. We learn from the oxen is that's how oxen are. Oxen have a way of producing, but it teaches us that there's work involved. The principle is this. Most things in life that are valuable, important, are hard and usually messy. They have kids. Kids teach you that from the beginning, right? They're messy. They leak all over the place. Through all kinds of orifices. They just leak, right? And, and they're noisy and it's difficult and you got to lose sleep and, and you do all the things and it's a worthy mess. That's life. Family is a mess work making. Ministry, same thing. I've heard people say about ministry, it would be great except you know, people are just difficult. 
Yeah, life is messy and life is hard. And the spiritual life is no different. But it's a, it's a mess worth making. It's a mess worth leaning into. That's what happens. That's how spiritual growth happens. You wade into the lives of people. Well, it's a mess. What are they, they think like everything is going to part in their life. Yeah, where do you think God's going to go to work? Be involved in that. Engage it. Don't shy away just to keep it neat and tidy. That's what he's saying here. Learn from the oxen. That's just part of it. So I made a note to myself. If, you, if you're going to have an oxen, I imagine you would have to plan a little bit to get an ox, right? I don't think they were inexpensive, just like a combine or whatever. Make a plan, but understand what's going to come from that. Now, moving to our last one. If you want to move over to chapter 23 of Proverbs, we're going to pick up the last animal of the day. The last animal of the day is going to be the eagle. I have some nice clip art there, I think, in the, in the bulletin. We're going to look at the eagle. Our next one, chapter 23, verse 4. Verse 4, this proverb is going to teach us some balance to the other proverbs that say, typically, you know, be really wise in who you partner with and, and be, be hard at work, understand the, the nature of hard work. This is teaching us some balance. Verse 4 of chapter 23. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Now the implication here on this one is this. It's not saying do not toil in the sense like what hard work I was talking about. The implication here is to overexert yourself. Don't wear yourself out so all you do is toil for wealth. Know anybody like that who's just given their whole life to gaining more and more and more? And then it's gone. Or they're gone. And they have worn themselves out trying to do this. Being discerning or wise enough to know when to stop, when to quit, when to not overdo it. And then he makes this idea here about wealth. Because you're like, oh, the eyes are lighting on it. It's like this, like the desire of the eyes that we got to have this, we got to have this, we've got to have this. And then suddenly it sprouts wings like an eagle. And if you've seen eagles, they fly like fast and they just, they're just gone, out of sight, just disappearing. A friend of mine used to teach a class on financial wellness, budgeting, and so on. And, and he used to talk about it, and he had a little picture of it, and it had a picture of dollars with little wings on it. And he says, you know what? Money talks. Have you heard that? Money talks. It usually says goodbye. That's why he said budget, so you know where the money is going to. Money will grow wings and disappear. Money suddenly, people look in the account, where did it go? I don't know. I don't know. He's saying that's how money can be, particularly if you over do the part of trying to make it something. And I would say specifically where God is saying, be rich toward me. It's like, it's like the man who had more, needed more barns. And he set his eyes on all this stuff and he says, I, I don't know what to do. I got more stuff. I'm just going to build more barns and fill them up. And then I'm going to just kick back and have a, have a good old time. And God says, you fool. See, tonight is your night, and you're gone. Now who's going to get it all? Wisdom would have been to know that and to dial it back and become rich toward God. Rich toward God. Balance is needed in this life. Yes, we work. We don't deny that. God ordained that through the curse in Genesis 3. And we work hard, and we, we do the right things, but we don't work 
to the end where that's all that matters. And that's what he's getting at here. This proverb teaches balance. While it's important, like I said, not to put your future in danger by bad deals or relationships. Or being too lazy to work is like flirting with poverty. And if you choose to work, accept that it's probably going to be difficult and messy. But wisdom is knowing when enough is enough. And wealth is notoriously fleeting. And I would say more than that. I think wealth is notoriously empty. It's empty. So, to summarize this, and we'll close it up here. The first two animals, the gazelle and the bird, teach us to what vigorously get away from bad deals and bad company. Put distance between them as quickly as possible. The ant teaches us to get to work on time without being told or cajoled and reap the benefit avoiding the pain of poverty. That's the benefit. You can avoid the pain. Number four, the ox teaches us that hard work is a mess worth making. And it will abundantly supply our needs. And lastly, the eagle teaches us the fleeting nature of wealth and that there is wisdom in contentment. So, make good, intentional choices regarding life, work, money, most of all towards God. Turn your eyes toward God. Follow his instruction. Go to the word. Let it feed you. Let it teach you. You can avoid the hardships. Some of them. And you can have balance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these proverbs where you've taken animals from your creation to teach us lessons. Teach us lessons about this life. Thank you that animals are consistent. They act the same way all the time. Unlike us who can act a lot of different ways and many of them are not good. Help us, Lord, to learn the lessons. Help us to be wise. Help us to turn our hearts and minds heavenward. To look to you, to ask of you wisdom. To go to your word, to seek for it like treasure. Help us to be rich toward you. Christ's name. Mr. Nick, will you please stand and sing, Savior like a shepherd, lead us. May he lead us the rest of the days of our life. Receive us.
Lord to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Have a blessed day. Oh, Pastor Nick. <laughs> You're good, buddy. Just about shut you. Let's pray. Father, we we thank you again and we praise you for goodness to for your goodness to us. That you draw us to yourself. That you with great compassion and generosity give to your children the things we need. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. And Again, we just lift our crew up who's far away from us in Guatemala today. Protect them, we pray. Grant their ministry success and effectiveness. And Lord, I just pray that as we walk out this life this week, wherever we go, that we would truly be salt and light to those around us, that we would point the way to you and to your son Jesus in his name.